the governor is here and we can get started. He's just about ready to walk in the door. I'm so proud to stand before you this morning and introduce a very special guest. Today we have the privilege of having the governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania join our 50th anniversary celebration. Governor Wolf grew up in a small town in York County. He still lives in the house he was brought home to from the hospital. He attended college at Dartmouth, but interrupted his studies to join the Peace Corps. And he served two years in a small village in India before returning to finish his undergraduate work. He later earned graduate degrees from the University of London and the Massachusetts Institution of Technology. While finishing his PhD, he worked for the family lumber and building products business the Wolf Organization, as a forklift operator and warehouse worker. Later, with two cousins, he bought the family business, and over the course of 25 years, they quintupled the business in size. From 2007 to 2009, Governor Wolf served the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as the Secretary of the Department of Revenue. He returned to the family business in 2009 during the depths of the recession, to bring the business back from the brink of bankruptcy. In January 20, 2015, Tom Wolfe was inaugurated as Pennsylvania's 47th governor. He has not backed down from his priorities to rebuild the middle class, to invest in our schools, and streamline government through jobs that pay, schools that teach, and government that works. It is with those goals and that philosophy in mind that we as an association look forward to continuing to work with Governor Wolf to ensure that the direct support professionals, PAR providers employ, have jobs that pay, jobs that pay, a living wage, a family sustaining wage. So now I ask you all to please rise to give a warm welcome to our governor, Tom Wolf. Thank you. Thank you very much. Surely that was a really nice introduction. And I did get the point, jobs that pay. Before I start, I want to just uh, congratulate the award winners um, from last night, the DSPs who, who were so uh, wonderfully recognized last night. Uh, I mean, I heard about it all the way down into York County. Um, it was, a, I know, an emotional evening, um, and the, the awards were, were given, uh, you know, were well-deserved, uh, but not just for the people who were directly affected. Everybody in the Commonwealth benefits from what you all do. And I need to do a better job. All of us here in Harrisburg need to do a better job of recognizing them. Uh, we need to put more funding uh, into your programs, and we need to get to the point where uh, you're not just doing this as a labor of love. You're not just doing this because you have a passion, you have a calling to do this, but because I want you to have that calling, but also because you, we, we recognize the value of that calling by making sure that you have the compensation you and your families need. So I, I pledge that I will do that. <laughs> now let me just point out the obvious. There's a cake here, and I, I guess we're going to cut it, right, Shirley? <laughs> just a few days ago was the 50th anniversary of the Pennsylvania Mental Health and Intellectual Disabilities Act of 1966. And the importance of that is twofold. The, the idea behind that was to give greater dignity and independence to the people who have intellectual disabilities. But the other part of that was that we had a, a, an equal, equally important responsibility to make sure that the loved ones, the people who cared for those folks who now had the greater independence that we wanted, that you had the resources to do what you've done. We have work to do in both of those areas, and that's what I want to talk about. 
As you know, the Act in 1966 established community services as a major new philosophy and a major new treatment policy in Pennsylvania. It created the foundation, really, for today's modern system where most individuals receive services not in institutions, but in the communities. This legislation ended the practice of non-discriminately sending those with disabilities or mental health issues to institutions. And so the anniversary of this bill actually is a good time to discuss what you're all discussing here today, and I'm proud to be here with you. PAR is continuing the important work that that 1966 legislation started. Since 1970, PAR has done wonderful work to assist those with mental health and intellectual disability issues and it has created a community of providers that deliver quality, personalized, and effective care to individuals in need. Today, your members, why am I telling you this? You all know this, right? Your members, <laughs> your members serve, I want to make sure everybody in Pennsylvania knows this, serves tens of thousands of people. You employ over 44,000 Pennsylvanians. You provide $1.7 billion in autism and intellectual disability services. That's pretty good. And that's a, I hope as you were applauding, you, you were applauding yourselves. You've done amazing work. And the direct care professionals who are part of your organization, as I said, do tremendous work. And I'm sorry I wasn't at the awards ceremony last night. You're on the front lines. You're assisting people so that they can live in their homes and continue to contribute to their communities. And again, that's not just important to you, it's not just important to the people you care for, it's not just important to the families and loved ones of those folks. It's important to everybody in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. You help people get jobs. You assist them to make sure that they have the resources they need to succeed. And you become friends, you become companions to people across the Commonwealth with autism, mental health issues, and intellectual disabilities. You really work hard for, for the folks that you work for. And your dedication and you bring excellence and dedication to the jobs every day. You are truly delivering on the promise of a safe and effective care in communities across Pennsylvania. You're doing that despite the fact that we don't pay you enough. You're doing that despite the fact that we don't recognize you adequately for all the things that you do. And we need to change that. At the state level, we need to live up to your example, pure and simple. We need to provide needed services at the right price with, to people with intellectual disabilities and behavioral health problems. Because we know that all Pennsylvanians should have the chance to live and work with dignity, freedom, and economic self-sufficiency. So my administration is committed to ensuring that all who need services are able to receive personalized, individualized care in their own communities. And I've done some things right. I think we have in the General Assembly done some things right. Earlier this year, I was proud to advocate for and I was proud to sign the PA ABLE Act, allowing families and people with qualified disabilities to have tax-free savings account. That was a small thing, but <laughs> as you know, as you know, these accounts can be used for a wide range of disability-related expenses, including health care, housing, and transportation, without jeopardizing eligibility for important programs on which these individuals with disabilities depend. And this, at the same time, the Department of Human Services, DHS, currently provides services to over 53,000 people with an intellectual disability. Over 70% of them live at home. Again, we have more work to do. As you know, these services are funded primarily through Medicaid, and DHS can only provide funding where, where it's authorized by the General Assembly. That means we're stuck with whatever Medicaid gives us, which has been, as Shirley told me, flat funding for the last how many years? Ten, at least ten years. And while I've been advocating for substantial increases in funding for services geared towards individuals with intellectual disabilities since I came into office, that hasn't been enough. Due to lack of funding allocated, there are still a substantial number of families and people who need but do not receive services. Shirley and I were talking about this earlier. Have you noticed that we have a tendency here in Harrisburg to really love to allocate funds? We love to appropriate funds. 
for all kinds of worthy services like the services you provide. You know what we don't like to do? It's raise the funds we need to actually pay for those things. And that's the problem we have. So I need to, to make sure that, that when I, we need to work together to make sure that when I advocate for those funds, for the distribution of those funds that you need so desperately, that you're gonna help me, I hope, raise the funds. Is that a deal? All right. Because you know better than anyone, we, we do have major problems. There are still 13,500 people on the waiting list for, I mean, that, that's just unacceptable. People who are above the age of 21, whose families and loved ones are caring for them, but who need help. Uh, and that help has to come from us here in Harrisburg, and we're not doing it. Last year, I hoped that we would be able to get 750 people off the waiting list. That wasn't much of anything compared to the 13,500 who were on it, and I failed to do that. Uh, failed because we didn't have the money raised in the budget. Failed because we misestimated. Uh, I don't want to say misunderestimated, misoverestimated. I mean, we misest. We didn't estimate properly the uh, the amount of money that it would take to get those 750 people, a, a small number, off the waiting list. We failed miserably, and I have been with families uh, who have suffered as a result of that, uh, and listened to the the story, the horror stories, because we failed to act here in Harrisburg. So I apologize for that. That was that was our our fault, and and I will make sure that, that we do a better job in the future. Um, what I want to do is to rectify this, and the goal I have is increase the percentage of people receiving intellectual disability services by 11 percent by 2020. I want to increase the number of people receiving autism services by 56% by that same year. These goals, of course, I mean, it's easy for me to stand up and say that's what I want because that's what we all want. These goals are contingent upon us receiving more funding from the General Assembly. And I, again, I need your help in continuing to advocate for those funds in the General Assembly on behalf of the people you serve and on behalf of yourselves. So strengthen my hands, strengthen your own hands, and let's go to work and get this done. I also, I also know, and again, this is in the uh, mea culpa era, area, I also know that the impasse in 2015-16, the budget impasse, really affected you. Uh, I fought to make sure interest payments were included in the final budget, and that didn't happen. So you were forced to borrow money, and you were forced to dig deeper into your own pockets, your own organizations, uh, to pay those interest expenses that you had because we couldn't get the work done here in, in Harrisburg. So I recognize that we have more work to do. I recognize that we have failed here in Harrisburg in a number of ways, and I pledge to you that I will do my best to make sure we don't fail again in the future. Please help me succeed. Thank you very much. First cut to the cake, and we'd like some of our award winners to please join us.
you so much, Governor, for your commitment that you have made. I suggest that we give a standing ovation for jobs that pay and meeting the waiting list needs. take just a, like a three minute stretch break here and then we'll begin with our program while we get our our um, our Dennis Felty on the podium. 